Hey there YouTube lovers, my name is BB8 and today I am going to review Banjo-Tooie. I already reviewed Banjo-Kazooie back in 2022, which wasn't the best made review, but I do plan on replaying it in 2025, where I can finally give the game a re-review. But now, we are talking about the sequel, Banjo-Tooie. The reason I didn't review Banjo-Tooie years ago is because my first run, I found it really difficult to understand how the worlds worked. Only because the world system in Banjo-Kazooie was different to Banjo-Tooie, but with Banjo-Tooie finally coming to Nintendo Switch Online, I thought I would give the game another run, and I now have a better understanding on how Banjo-Tooie's world system works, now that it's been two years. Now, before we get into the review itself, I want to provide a recap on what I thought on the original Banjo-Kazooie. Overall, I do give Banjo-Kazooie an 8.7 out of 10. With the score of 8.7, Banjo-Kazooie has made it to one of my favourite Nintendo 64 games of all time, beating Super Mario 64. I do like Super Mario 64 and all. But I do think the gameplay in Banjo-Kazooie is better, in my opinion. When I first reviewed it, I gave Banjo-Kazooie an 8.7 out of 10. But since I don't use a decimal system in my reviews anymore, it now rounds up to a 9 out of 10. I thought it was a fun 3D platformer and was easily one of my favourite games to have released on the Nintendo 64, and since then, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time surpassed it, and even though Ocarina of Time already has certified gold, a video review will come out in 2025, but back on topic. But what did I think of Banjo-Tooie? You're about to find out. So, without further ado, let's get into it, shall we? For the gameplay. Banjo-Tooie stays true to the original Banjo-Kazooie while adding more moves for Banjo and Kazooie to master, which does make the gameplay more engaging and adds more to the puzzle design, especially with the amount of creative ways there are to solve puzzles, especially with the new transformations that Banjo-Tooie has to offer. You can even play the game with Kazooie as a dragon. I did it and it was well worth it. The world system, while the worlds in Banjo-Tooie were larger than Banjo-Kazooie, does come with a few issues. While it wasn't as big of an issue as it was for me compared to the first Luigi's Mansion game, but I can finally admit for now, I did not grow up with backtracking related games. But if Banjo-Tooie did one thing better, than Banjo-Kazooie, it's probably the fast travel system, which I do think there are various ways that you can fast travel around the map, which I think are quite handy, such as the secret passages, the platform portals, and train stations in different worlds. And I feel like Banjo-Kazooie did get more creative with the fast travel system with the cauldrons, but, but Banjo-Tooie does have a more convenient fast travel system, given that these are bigger maps than the original Banjo-Kazooie after all. The only downside to Banjo-Tooie's gameplay is that the first person sections haven't really aged that well. The controls in segments like these can be frustrating, especially with one jiggy in Mayahem Temple, as well as the boss fight against Lord Wu. I'm trying not to say his name too fast, because it would sound like I'm dropping an F-bomb if I did. So I'm literally just gonna put his name on screen in the final video, just so you know I didn't drop an F-bomb here. Where you have to fire at different weak spots on his body kind of felt frustrating to fight, and the way that you control Banjo and Kazooie in first person wasn't as frustrating for me 
as it was in GoldenEye 007, which I still haven't reviewed, but I'll get there. And I do understand that these are games from the Nintendo 64, but I feel like they are frustrating to play in certain sections on NSO because of it. And despite these flaws within the gameplay, Banjo-Tooie still remains fun, even if some areas, such as the controls, feel a little outdated. For the graphics and the performance, considering that this is a game from the Nintendo 64, I'm not judging it by the visuals of today's standards. I'm sharing my thoughts based on the Nintendo 64 standards. And for a Nintendo 64 game, Banjo-Tooie looks pretty good visually. The lighting in certain areas, such as the entrance to Pterodactyl Land, where everything on screen is red because of the lighting, and the details put into each environment is well thought out as well. One thing I would like to bring up is the file select screen, because this has to be one of my favourite file select screens in all of the Nintendo 64 era, because it uses different items in Banjo and Kazooie's house as features within the file select screen, such as a Nintendo 64 for multiplayer, a hexagon shaped TV for the settings, a TV box if people still use those, as something that can allow you to replay mini games, bosses, and cutscenes, a camera which can allow you to copy a game file, and the trash can allow you to erase a game file. The Nintendo Switch Online version does actually have a few improvements from the original Banjo-Tooie, such as the models looking sharper, which is to be expected from a Nintendo 64 NSO game, as well as improved performance, which feels smoother than the original game. But that doesn't mean every aspect of the NSO version is perfect though, since the issue was noticed in Cloud Cuckoo Land where you used the plant cannons to cross over to different areas. Yeah, the frame rate did kind of suck in that area. And while the problem isn't a big deal, because it is only one area in the game I've experienced an issue like this. It doesn't disrupt from the overall experience. Still, for a game released in 2000, Banjo-Tooie utilized the Nintendo 64's graphical limitations very well, creating worlds that are unique, even though I didn't find them to be as memorable as the original Banjo-Kazooie. Banjo-Tooie still looks appealing visually even though it's nearly a quarter century old. For the characters, Banjo and Kazooie have more personality added to their characters in this sequel, with an expanded moveset that gives them more to work with when solving puzzles to gain jiggies, which is what I enjoyed most about Banjo-Tooie. And while not all transformations in the game were hits with me, such as the snowball or the van, while some of them I did find funny, like the washing machine, my favourites this time around probably had to be the T-Rex in Pterodactyl Land and Dragon Kazooie, who adds an extra flavour not only to the combat, but traversal as well. The supporting characters in Banjo-Tooie are still fun in comparison to Banjo-Kazooie. Of course, Bottles the Mole dies at the beginning of the game after Banjo's house gets destroyed, so Bottles doesn't really play that big of a role in the game. Yeah, Bottles may play a big role towards the plot, but I don't really have much to talk about with Bottles since we only see him at the beginning and the end of the game. And the character I feel like has had a huge expansion in terms of role is Mumbo Jumbo, because you could play as him in areas where you need to reach magic platforms in order for him to use his magic spells to perform different tasks, whether it be forming a rainbow to cross over to another island in Cloud Cuckoo Land, or growing a, bi a baby Triceratops back to its normal size in Pterodactyl Land. I still think, I still think the character interactions throughout the Isle of Hags is fun and brings life and personality to characters 
who may not play a big role within the game at all. Banjo Tui also does have solid boss variety, even though some bosses didn't hit with me, such as Lord Wu as I just said in the gameplay section, but Patchy in Witchy World had to be my favourite in the whole game. And Banjo Tui and its predecessor Banjo Kazooie both have a memorable cast of characters which does make the appeal of the sequel last a bit longer. For the story, Banjo Tooie, like Mario, isn't deep in story but succeeds with the humour and style it is trying to go for. The dialogue is stuffed with fourth wall breaks and clever jokes, which isn't a bad thing because it makes Banjo and Kazooie stand out as the gaming equivalent of Deadpool by including dialogue styles like this. And it shows that Rare were leaning more into humour over plot complexity, creating cutscenes that are entertaining to watch and had some moments that made the game more enjoyable, such as stealing the treasure in Pterodactyl Land, and while there isn't a deep story to be told in banjo Tooie, it follows a comedic, light-hearted approach, which makes it stand out from the competition. It doesn't take itself too seriously, which does allow the humour to be more impactful even though the story is not complex, and banjo Tooie still has personality in the way that few games from the N64 era could. At the end of the day, banjo Tooie manages to come on par with its 1998 predecessor, even if the world design isn't as good. banjo Tooie is a well-made sequel, even with its flaws such as the first-person segments, the gameplay still feels good and reminds me well of everything I miss about 3D platformers from the late 90s and early 2000s, with extra abilities, transformations, and humour to keep the sequel fresh, and that is why I give banjo Tooie the collector perk. And overall, I give banjo Tooie a 9 out of 10. banjo Tooie is a worthy sequel that provides plenty of fun for people who enjoyed the original game, such as the expanded mechanics, fun characters, and well-written humour which make banjo Tooie a must-play for anyone looking for a 3D platformer from the 90s. And even though both games are on par with each other, if I had to pick one of the two, I would probably pick Banjo-Kazooie. So guys, what did you think of my review? of banjo Tooie. I don't know when I'm going to review the remaining three Banjo games, consisting of Banjo and Kazooie Grunty's Revenge and Banjo Pilot from the Game Boy Advance, as well as Banjo Kazooie Nuts and Bolts from the Xbox 360. But I can confirm that Banjo Kazooie will be getting a re-review in 2025. And next week on BBA Task Reviews. For the 10th anniversary of Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, we are going to review both Ruby and Sapphire, as well as their remakes, Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. So, don't forget to subscribe to my channel, like this video, and turn your notification bell on, so you don't miss another review video like this one. And I will see you all in a future video, BB-8 out.